Boston for our Sunday school superintendent, Mother Linda Daniels, and my co-laborers, Mother Cleo Ramsey, missionary Sherry Jackson, Brother Norris Minter, and our newest teacher, who may be new to some, but not to others, Sister Latoya Harris. Now, my name is Deacon Robert Krause, and I feel very blessed and privileged to be your humble servant this evening for just a moment to be able to bring you tonight's lesson that's titled, The Temple Rebuilt. You know, where our lesson scripture will come from the book of Haggai, chapter one, verses you know, one to four, uh, then uh, verses seven to 10, and then we'll wrap it up on with verses 12 to 15. So on behalf of St. Andrew Church of God in Christ, located at 608 Lakey Street in the city of Denton, Texas, where we're blessed, we're so blessed to have as our pastor and shepherd is Superintendent Clarence Harden and our lovely First Lady Missionary Betty Harden, who preach, who teach, who pray, and proclaim God's word, inviting all who desire to sit at his table and partake of God's blessing. So if you're looking for a church home, if you're looking for prayer, if you're looking for fellowship, the doors of St. Andrew Church of God in Christ are wide open to you, for you are so very, very welcome. Amen. So let us go you know, to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to come together one more time, as this is the day you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, as it's a day we haven't seen and we will never see again. We lift up our pastor and his wife to you, Father, that you keep them in perfect peace. For you say in your word that perfect peace comes to those whose minds are stayed on you. So cover them, Lord. Embrace them, Lord. Protect them, Lord. And strengthen them with the equipping power to do your will and to continue your work among your people. And we want to thank you in advance. Lord, we ask that you bless those who are seeking your word. Bless those who proclaim your word and bless those who hear your word for you want all to be saved and none to be lost. So we ask for a special blessing to those who will receive your word tonight. We thank you for blessing us with this time of prayer and study. So we ask that our burdens be lifted and that you strip us bare from those thoughts that may distract or discourage us so that our focus will be on you and not ourselves. Let us be satisfied and settled before you. Fill us with your spirit and your truth. We love you, Lord. We want to know more of you, Lord. We want to know more of your ways. We want to know more of your plans. We want to know more of your heart. For we love you, we honor you, and we want to give you the glory. So, Lord, teach us, Lord. Convict us, Lord. Come and encourage us and strengthen us and place us, place that desire in us to seek you, Lord, where you direct our paths and you are a lamp to our feet, giving us the wisdom, the clarity, and comfort that comes from you and only you. For you say your yoke is easy and your burden is light, and you will give us rest. So we thank you in advance for all the things you do, you know, for us that we can't do for ourselves. And we praise and magnify you for there is none like you or ever will be. These and all the blessings we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen, amen, and amen, amen. So tonight's lesson titled The Temple Rebuilt, the prophet is given a word to tell the people about time being wasted hiding behind it and using it as an excuse. The Bible tells us to redeem the time wisely, but there are times when we don't. And we place God behind our needs, our wants, and our desires, and God is not pleased and will hold back his blessings. So it's all about the importance of refocusing our priorities on God. Now, God stands in eternity. It's a place inside and outside of time, a place that we couldn't even fathom, but he controls it. He can add to it or he can take it away. He gives us three score and 10 years to get it right, to redeem the time wisely that he gives us. From cradle to grave, we know that there are important times we remember. A child's birth, the first day of school, graduation, our first love, our first job, home, car, successes, failures, disappointments, and celebrations. Now, through it all, God has provided for us even when we didn't even know about it. But time has shown. The Bible has shown that we can be a thick-headed people at times. As God proclaimed in Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone. Now, we know that when time passes, it heals all wounds, memories fade, we get complacent, we get lazy. We convince ourselves there's no need to rush, that what's here today will be there tomorrow. Now, Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 tells us, therefore, be careful how you walk not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, what the will of the Lord is. Now times change and God commands us to keep up with the times. He knows what's important to us, whatever that may be. 
that will devote whatever time is necessary to achieve it. Now, we have built monuments, statues, memorials devoted to events in time. We memorialize it, we celebrate it, we sanction it, and in, in some cases, we even legislate it. Even our phones capture a moment in time. Time is so important to us that we talk about it all the time. Time marches on. Time flies. Time heals all wounds. Time is money. Times are wasted. Time to make things right. We wait for the right time, but we get impatient when time takes too long and we have good times and bad, happy times and sad. We know things will take time. It's that one thing we can't add or even take away. The world tells us that how, how to use my time is none of your business and that my time is more important than yours. But we also know that in time we'll grow up and time will get it. But it's the one thing we can't hide behind, time and the way we use it. Even Solomon was perplexed by time. He pondered and God revealed it to him in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter three. To everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to ring, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. And then in verse 9, what profit hath he worketh in that wherein he laboreth? So time is extremely important to us. We value it, we waste it, we gain it, we lose it. With God, time is something valuable. It's something that shouldn't be wasted. It's something that shouldn't be frittered away. God is our source. God is our reason. God is our provider. He's our protector and way maker. But in tonight's lesson, the people forgot to finish God's work and needed to be reminded it's time. So now if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Haggai, okay? Chapter 1 you know, verses one to four, then we go to verses seven to 10, and then we'll wrap it up with uh, verses 12 to 15, starting in verse one. In the second year of Darius the king, and I want you to remember that, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest saying, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying, this people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai to the, the prophet saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lies the waste? Go to verse seven. Thus say the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Verse nine, ye look for much and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, it did the blow upon it. Why? Say the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. So therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And then verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So in the four and 20th day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Now, Haggai is one of the minor prophets, and, and the book of Haggai only consists of two chapters. But his ministry was to the children of Israel as they were at the end of their captivity. God's people were taken, were, were taken 70 years ago by the Babylonians who were ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, the Babylonians destroyed Judah. They destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed Solomon's temple and took all the sacred objects all things of value plus all the people captive. The children of Israel were in captivity by Nebuchadnezzar who ruled over them for the next 47 years until the Babylonians were defeated by the Persians. Now scripture tells us in the book of Ezra that 15 years prior that God moved upon the spirit of King Cyrus to decree the return of the Jewish exiles to the homeland to rebuild and resume worship. Now I'm gonna say that again. 
to rebuild and to worship. Now, God has been gracious to them and have placed it on the king's heart to let them return. He sent his prophet Haggai and Zechariah, you know, to encourage the people. He positions Rubabel as the governor to oversee their return and the rebuilding work. And he positioned Joshua as the high priest to oversee the worship. Now, the king gave them everything they needed. All they had to do was show up and do the work. None of them had any reason as to why they couldn't do what they were instructed to do. Now, we know that our journey of faith, sometimes it becomes difficult. We know that once we commit to serving God, that opposition will come, troubles will come, that there will be people placed in our way to impair and impede the work of the Lord. We will get challenged on every front, but through all of that, we know that God is our source. He'll give us the strength, the means, the wherewithal to succeed. We know that whatever work God blesses, he can do anything but fail, but we have to hold on and remain committed. We have to remain faithful. We can't be discouraged where our ministry and our faith is placed on the back shelf until, until times get better. We need to keep the main thing, the main thing. The children of Israel, these exiles face opposition on many fronts and they became discouraged and sadly the work comes to a halt for the next 15 years and God is not pleased. Not because the work stopped, but because the reasons why his house laid in ruins for the next 15 years. So Haggai visits with them again. So let's get into the lesson, starting in verse one. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, thus speak to the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Now God's remnant has been free to move back to Judah, back to Jerusalem, back to their homelands for the sole purpose of rebuilding the temple and to resume worship. They only got as far as to rebuild the altar and lay the foundation for the temple. But the people became discouraged and the work stopped and lay dormant for the next 15 years. And the people began to focus on themselves more and more and focus on God, you know, became less and less. And they decided now is not a good time to rebuild and decide to put God's business on the back shelf. But God is patient. God is gracious. God is just. And at this point, God decides that the clock has ticked long enough, and this is time for him to step in, and he gives a word to Haggai to light a fire under the people one more time. And he sends Haggai to the ones who were there from the beginning, the governor, Zerubbabel, and the high priest, Joshua, the ones who were charged and placed in authority to get the work done. But they haven't done anything, anything at all to get it going again. So as the scripture tells us in the first verse that on this day, the sixth month, in the first day, in the second year of King Darius, things are about to change. And we look at the Hebrew calendar. This was September 1st, the festival of the new moon, where work stops and people look for a word from a prophet. Now, the word from Haggai is this, is because God is angry. He's displeased and he wants answers from Zerubbabel and Joshua. But he refers to the children of Israel as this people, not his people, but this people. Who are these people who have decided that the time is not right to build the Lord's house? If not now, then when? Let's go to verse three. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lies waste? From the beginning, God supplied the means. He gave them instructions on how to rebuild the temple. He supplied the craftsmen, the carpenters, the iron workers, stonemasons, the money and the motivation and the freedom to complete the task and the time to do it in. Now, Haggai, you know, speaks to the same people in power who were appointed, who were assigned, who were instructed to rebuild the temple. It wasn't easy. They faced opposition from their captors, from the leaders in neighboring areas, and the conflicts between those from the northern and southern kingdoms who had their own agendas for Jerusalem. But like the people, they started strong, but they didn't finish well. They became lazy and complacent, and you know how we can get when we feel things are not urgent and there's more important things for us to do. It's about neglect. Now, Haggai calls them out on their hypocrisy. You don't have time to build my house. The woman who sustains you, the one who provides for you, the one who freed you from captivity, the one who holds up the heavens, the one who prospers and keeps you from any hurt, harm, or danger, but you don't have time to do what I command you to do. But you found the time to do what you wanted. You found the time to build your own houses, but not only to build them, but to build them with walls and ceilings to build all the comforts for yourself. But my house, the Lord's house, 
the main reason for your return to Jerusalem, you put off and let it be barren, and my house is still laid to waste. Now, something needs to be done. Something was to be done. Something has to be done. And God is upset that nothing has been done to finish the work. Now, God asked the question, what's the problem? Why is my house not built? I've given you everything you need to do it. When will be the right time to build it? Is it time for you to build your own houses with covered walls and ceilings, but my house still sits in ruins? Now, Haggai tells them they need to come up with plan B, for time is not the problem, okay? 15 long years have gone by, but it didn't stop you from doing what you wanted to do. God through Haggai tells them something has to change. The time for excuses are over. So let's get to the heart of the matter. Time for the truth of the matter. It's time to be humble. Let's go to verse 7. Thus say the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Verse 9, ye look for much, and lo, came the little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is laid to waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. Consider your ways. What makes you think you can put off what I commanded you to do? This is a rebuke from the Lord. Now as what the people will do next and how they respond will affect how God responds to them. He lets the people know that their efforts, their homes, their work is blessed by him. But because of neglect, because of apathy, because of the laziness of the people, God holds back his blessing. He holds back prosperity. He holds back increase. He tells them that you seek more, but you'll never get it. You'll never achieve it. Whatever you put in the ground, I'll just blow it away. Everything you do will be a struggle because I hold back the dew from the heavens. Your crops, your harvest will always be poor. Instead of stepping up and committing fully to the work, you'd rather run to your houses because now is not the right time. Neglect. Now, we know God has a way of humbling us when he has to. We struggle. We wrestle. We carry a burden about something or someone. He places a thought or a vision in our heads that we just can't shake. We have an urge and a desire to do what God wants us to do but it always begins with us to consider our ways. Be that reflection of God that we're supposed to be. Second Corinthians 13 and five, Paul challenges the Corinthian church to pause in what they were doing and, and to know why they were doing it. And it says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, prove your own selves. God gives them three things to do in order to redeem themselves. And it starts with obedience. He says, one, go to the mountain. Now you need to commit. You need to stop what you're doing. You need to get out of your covered houses and go to the place I send you. Two, bring the wood. My house needs a certain kind of wood. It needs fresh wood. It needs new wood that you'll find on this mountain. You have the carpenters and all the skilled labor you need, so you have no reason to worry about what you can't do. Three, build a house. Build it and construct it according to the specifications I gave you 15 years ago. If you do these things, I will be pleased. I will be glorified. Now, as believers, we always should be mindful of God's work in our lives to keep focus on what's important, what's critical in maintaining our relationship with the Lord. God blesses us with the years to live this life. Every day, every month, every year, he gives us a blessing. And we have to figure out a way to live it, that he's at the center of it. Whatever he's called us to do, we should give our very best to the one who gives us his very best. When we even look at our church, we know it was built by hands, but blessed by God. Anytime we see God's house, we should rejoice because it serves as a continuing symbol of God's grace and his faithfulness to his people, a light that will always shine through the world's darkness that gives him glory. Amen. So let's go to verse 12 and 15. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God has sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So in the four and 20th day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. 
Now, verse 13 tells us that after all the struggle, after the prophet calls them out, after the prophet reminds them of the importance of a committed faith, after reminding them that God is watching, he's patient, he's gracious, but time is not your friend, especially when there's work to be done, work to be completed that you gave, that you give God what he gives you the very best. Neglect. They became complacent and they drifted to a place where they just didn't care. So God sends his prophet to light a fire under them to direct them back to where he wants them to be. Now, God, through his prophet, put that spotlight on them to inspect them. He called them out when they fell short, shaming them so that it revealed their lack of faith. But most importantly, that God is to be their source, to place them back on the right path. So we see that in 23 days, 23 days, God places them all back on the right path. They hear the words of Haggai, and they remember who the God that blesses them and what they are to be doing, and they get back to work on God's house, that God is with them as he's pleased. Now, when we trust and believe and put him, what, before all of the busyness of the world, God tells us to make time for him, to see things the way he sees it, to hear things with clarity and understanding, to act in ways that glorifies him, that when people look upon us, they want to embrace the same things we embrace. He is our Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He's our Jehovah Nisi, our strong banner. He is our good shepherd. He is our rock and our fortress. So at this time, I just want to be able to say, as I wrap up this evening's lesson, we see how God sends his prophet back to the people to remind them of their assignments. He challenges them. He rebukes them. He admonishes them. And he reminds them that the attention to God's business is important. It's critical to complete the work as it's a measure of their faith and their obedience. This life we have places pressures on us on all sides. We never deny that. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's very hard. But it's necessary to know who keeps and steadies us to know that he will never leave nor forsake us in our time of need. Now, promises made, promises kept. God calls on us to keep our word, that it be yea or nay. You know, and it has to be couched in faith because anything other than that is a sin. But we praise him that he's not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. For whatever he, ever he has spoken will come to pass. For whatever God acts upon is decided both in what earth and in heaven. Now, we don't want to be found guilty of blocking or delaying our blessings the way the exiles did. This serves as a reminder to always consider our ways when it comes to the things of God. Psalm 119, verse 33 to 40, places our salvation this way. You know, it says, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. Give me understanding. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Establish thy word and turn away my reproach. And then quicken me in thy righteousness. Save and keep me. Now, if you don't know Jesus as Savior, God is knocking right now. All you have to do is accept and believe. His word tells us that for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confessions made unto salvation. So come right now. Come as you are for God is faithful to forgive. Just believe that he is who he says he is, that he is the son of God who was born of the spirit, lived and died on the cross for your sins and that he sits at the right hand of God ready to fully accept, fully embrace and fully adopt you as one of his own. Now, if you truly believe in your heart and confess with your mouth through faith that he is the son of God and that you repent of your sins and are in need of a savior, you are saved and we welcome you. Amen. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we were able to come together and break bread and study your word, Lord. Lord, we ask that you continue to open up our hearts open up our minds, give us the clarity and understanding that has to come from you, Lord, so that we may be able to give you glory in all that we do. So, Lord, we ask that you continue to bless the Sunday school, bless the ones that are underneath the sound of my voice, bless the ones that will look at this video later, and we and bless those of one that who have come to the saving grace, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Savior. So, Lord, we want to thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 So, as a child of God, the do's and don'ts, the wills and won'ts that you place before us are never a burden for us, as you tell us that your yoke is easy and your burden is light and blesses, enlightens, and empowers us to move forward and climb higher for you, Lord. We thank you for the many blessings and the grace you have shown us. We will always be mindful to be thankful in all things, as this is your will for us. 
So may God bless, may God keep, and may God shower you and your families with his love this day. May his face shine upon you and may he rest, rule, and abide with you now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and for his sake, amen, amen. So we hope that you have been encouraged by tonight's lesson and that you will join us again during our Sunday School Inspiration Time, where you are so very welcome. If you need a place, a church home, always visit us at St. Andrew at 608 Lakey Street, then Texas. And if not, then we pray that, you know, for those who are seeking a church home, we pray that you go to a God-fearing church, that you'll be able to grow in grace and faith, and that you'll be loved on, cared for, connected, and built up. Amen. So we want to thank you again. Join us again next time. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.